Don't have time to pre-read your students' school books? Here are some ideas. Welcome to the Simply Charlotte Mason podcast. I'm Sonia Schaefer. In a Charlotte Mason education, pre-reading the books that your students are going to be reading can really add to the narration and the discussion that follows them. But how do you find time to do all of that pre-reading? That's a struggle a lot of us have, and I want to discuss that today with my friend Amber O'Neill Johnston. Amber, we've talked about this before. You do pre-read your students' books, correct? I do pre-read, especially when I'm not going to be reading aloud with them or we're not reading it as a family. So now that I have a, a group of independent readers who are going to be off reading their own material, I do make sure that I've read those books. And um, you have how many kids? I have four children. Three of them are independent readers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's talk first about why we should put forth the effort oh. to do this because it is an effort. Yes. It's not an easy thing. No. <laughs> what are the benefits of it? I think there are several. First of all, just from a family perspective, I think that I think of all of the discussions and the rich conversations when we're all reading the same things or when I'm reading the things that they've read, um, inside jokes that we have in our family, references um, when we're out and about. And little things that a child may say that I'll understand, and my children are speaking those same languages. A lot of times they're reading the same books, maybe one a year after or two years after the other sibling. They're like, now I know what you meant. <laughs> and I also would like to participate in those conversations. It's part of our family culture. So I think that's one reason. Also, it helps me with the narration. When I'm listening to a narration, I feel like I can listen and generally tell you know, how my child's doing, even probably if I hadn't read the book. But I like to be able to actually enjoy the narration. It's not just an exercise or just something for them to do. But um, I feel like it's giving them the respect of an audience who understands what they're talking about. And following the narration, we also often have discussions. And um, sometimes the children ask me questions. Um, and I think that for my kids, they know that I understand what they're reading and have read it. And I think it helps them see that I value um, what they're doing and what I'm asking them to spend their time on that I value it enough that I am preparing for them. Yes. So I, yeah. I think um, Charlotte talked a lot about mental sympathy yes. between the teacher and the student. And what you're describing there is the picture of mental sympathy yeah. that, yeah, I'm feeling the same things you are. I've walked that, that same path. Definitely. And, and what you're talking about. I also, that reminded me of a uh, concept in the book Know and Tell by Karen yeah. Glass yeah. and how she emphasized that narration is a relationship building activity, yes. not just a test. Yes, that was a, a friend of mine gave me that book for my birthday one year. That's such a good birthday gift. But yes, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think that that's what I feel and that's kind of what I'm describing. So I see it as a gift to my child. It also, pre-reading has been a gift to me. Mm -hmm. So we often talk about moms receiving this second education as a homeschooler. So, you know, I I delight in those books that they're reading. I enjoy them. Um, uh, so a lot of them I never read mm -hmm. growing up. Right. Some of them I did, but I'm seeing them through new eyes now. And so uh, part of it is pleasure for me. And even though my time is limited and it can be a little bit stressful at times to, tr time to try to pre-read, it is still something that is good for me. It's nice. I enjoy it. So that's another thing. One other thing that I think is very important, um, when the children are off reading books on their own, I also want to be aware of things that could be problematic yes. that come up, things that could be disturbing or confusing for them, um, things or messages or ideas that may not align perfectly with what we believe as a family. And I don't necessarily want to throw the book out because there are other valuable things about that book. But I do want to be able to have a conversation with them. And sometimes it's not even to warn them. It's just for me to be aware of what my child now knows that perhaps mm -hmm they hadn't known before. Mm -hmm. So I kind of have one eyebrow up, like, see, let me see what she's going to think about this or what he feels about this. Um, and also training the children to be able to say uh, what you read in this area. If you were to ever encounter that in a book that I hadn't read, that's the type of thing that I would want you to bring to me. As you bring up, if that's in a book I haven't read, yes. 
those situations do occur. Yeah. I mean, we don't read everything no. that our children do. That's the ideal. Yes. But sometimes we don't attain to that. Right. So let's give some tips at least as to... I don't want us to say, well, I can't ever read all of them, so never mind, I'm not even going to try. Right. We, we don't want to go there at all right. because there are so many benefits yes. to pre-reading the books. Yes. So can we give our viewers and our listeners some tips, some hope, yeah. some strategies <laughs> yes. as to how do you make this happen? You know, the mom who has the two preschoolers sure. and the newborn, sure. plus the three other school-aged children, how is she going to make this work? Okay, so I try to um, prioritize books, again, that I'm not going to be reading aloud. If I'm going to be reading the book aloud, those will be the first ones that I put at the end of the list because I can kind of shift and, and do what I need to do on the fly at times. Um, so I prioritize the books for me pre-reading that my children are going to be reading on their own. And I prioritize their school books, their lesson books first and foremost out of those. So As opposed to free reads, okay. things that they're going to be reading and on their own at leisure. Their, yes, gotcha. their leisure time. That for me, I honestly can't keep up. And, and right. that's a good thing. I mean, I wanted a literary household and I got one. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And so I cannot keep up with, with all of their, their leisure time reading. I rely a lot on trusted reviews. And those come from friends that I, I, I know that we're like-minded. I know they know what I kind of want to be alerted about, and I do the same for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. It comes from people that I respect. If, if you've read a book, Sonia, I'm okay with my <laughs> with one of my kids reading it. I think I'm like, I think it'll be okay. Um, you know, sources like Redeemed Reader and their reviews. or, or um, and, and yes, I read reviews on Amazon and everything, but I find that I get the most value out of reviews that have been done by people who are raising children in the same way yes. that I'm raising the children. I can just feel more confident with those. So I do rely a lot on reviews. I've also learned how to do a really good heavy skim. So I may not be reading every word or every chapter, but maybe the opening chapter, the ending, flipping through, kind of seeing what the, the arc of this book is, what are the main messages in this book without reading every single word. Um, and I also have worked with training my children that if I, if there's something I miss, there will be, there are things always that I'm going to miss that they will come to me. They know exactly the things that might make them feel a little uncomfortable or that they're not certain about. They'll, they'll bring those things to me. And then I also pray about it. I pray for covering that, um, my children's eyes and ears are protected against things that I may have missed. Yes. Yes. And that as you said, they will notice and come to you yes. with it yes. so you can discuss it. Because it's somewhat scary. We've chosen to homeschool because we want to be the prominent voice speaking into our children's hearts. Right. And now we're opening up that control, if you will, that yes. covering. Um, but as you said, the Lord can can oversee that much better than we can. And he can see in our children's hearts. That's right. So we can trust him with that. Yes. That doesn't mean we're going to be irresponsible. No. But we can trust him. To... We do our best. And yes. it changes from time to time. There are times and seasons and years where I can do a lot more pre-reading. 100%. Sure. It's a perfect year. And then there are years where I'm just barely holding on. I'm depending a lot on my friends and, and their recommendations and, and the curriculum that I've trusted. And, and I just haven't been able to, to do it all. Um, so I think that that changes as we go. I was talking to a mom a couple of weeks ago, and she was addressing this very topic, asking, how do you read all of these books ahead of time? What, what do you do? And I, so I said, how old are your children? Mm -hmm. And she said, three and five. So I said, start now. No. Yeah. <laughs> this is the time. Yeah. And she kind of laughed at first. She thought it was a joke, but it's not. No. you got to give a head start. Yes. Or they're going to catch up to you. It's, it's like the Indiana Jones scene, yeah. running ahead of that ball that's rolling <laughs> yes. behind you. Yes. you know? So even if your children are older, uh, well, let's start here. If your children are younger, yes. start looking at curriculum you want to use, the books you want to use, and start reading them now. And take notes yes, that's as very you important. read. Yes. Because five years from now, when you get there, 
you're not going to remember all the little nuances and exactly where that that one incident was yes. that you might want to discuss. It's like I remember movies that I enjoyed 20 years ago, and when I go back to watch them, it's like, oh I didn't remember God. that yes. was in there. Yeah, same thing. I know I've gotten caught a couple times with that with my kids. I will always show you this movie I loved growing up, and I'm like, wait, pause, stop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -oh. yeah. Forgot about that. Yes. So the same thing can happen with books. Sure. Do you keep notes? I do, and they help me immensely. And it's not like this big formal outline or whatever. Honestly, I usually am just writing in the margins. I also have a notebook, this one notebook. If I lose everything else, this one notebook has all my good notes for, for homeschool over the years. Um, but I do write in the margins or I'll give a heads up or in the front cover. Um, maybe I'll, I'll say, let's read chapter six uh, together. So if my child's oh. reading the book on their own, I know that there was something, I don't even always remember why, but that I wanted to read chapter six aloud together. So it could be probably most likely for me, the introduction of something, um, a topic that my children may not have a lot of experience with. So like the family under the bridge, we hadn't talked a lot about homelessness yet mm -hmm. or that they knew about it, but the fact that children could be without a home. Mm -hmm. And so that was a note I had in there. Let's talk about that before I hand this book over. So my notes are valuable. They're golden. <laughs> yes, yes. So. And it doesn't mean that you sit down and read all day every day. No. A lot of times, even if you can do, well, I calculated this out. Okay. <laughs> if you can read 15 minutes a day, just Monday through Friday, okay. not even weekends, but or, you know, another five days a week, whatever it is, if you can read 15 minutes a day, at the end of the year, you will have accumulated 65 hours of reading. Wow. It's amazing how those small, constant touches add it's true. up. It's true. And you can read a lot of books in 65 hours. Yes. That's amazing. Or do heavy skimming in 65 hours yes. and taking those notes. So even if you um, can only stay one term ahead, yes. you're still ahead of the rolling ball. Yeah. And, and use your breaks. Use your holiday breaks. Use your summer breaks to just keep that habit going. And maybe you can nudge it out and do a half hour a day during the breaks. But... It's important. Yeah, those are definitely ideas. I mean, I do even the week between our terms, I do a lot of reading. And sometimes, I'm not going to lie, I'm reading for that next term. And I'm right. just like right ahead of them. My, my yeah. head's right over water. <laughs> um, but usually, I hopefully am reading out further on. But between terms, um, holiday breaks, um, yeah, like you said, the summer, uh, I also use my car time time when we're commuting mm. back and forth in the car, I was reading and listening, I said reading, listening to an audiobook on the way here today. So um, I do rely a lot on audiobooks in the car. When you're alone yes. or when the kids are with you? Usually when I'm by myself, yeah. but I take every minute. You talked about those 15 minutes a day. Yeah. So even just going to the grocery store and it's right up the, the road, I still put my audiobook on. And I, you'd be surprised, just those little snatches of time here, there, everywhere, um, if I go for a walk around the neighborhood, I'll just put my um, earpiece in and and 10 or 15 minutes here or there, it really, I mean, I finish books. I go through a yeah. lot of books on audiobook through, through the year. Um, I also am an early riser, so I get up really, really early and I read in the morning. I have a nice cup of tea. I do other things too. I'm not just reading, but anything that I need to do that's concentrating without the children, that's my time to like fill myself up. And I pre-read a lot in the morning. And see, that works for you, but that would not work for me. <laughs> if I got up early, early in the morning and started to read, I'd fall asleep. And that's me at night. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to read for tomorrow. We're going to do something. And I lay there and I'm like, uh, I'm out you know, at night. So once the kids go to bed, I really, I might be able to squeeze out a blog post, but I can't, I can't usually read a book. So what I'm hearing is that it really depends on the person. You got to know yourself yes. as well as your, your family schedule. Sure. When you can grab those moments, but you've got to be intentional about it. It's not just going, the book isn't going to just land in your hand no. automatically. You've got to be intentional about it. Yeah, and I think having a list, too, of where you're going. So yes. you don't even have to think about it. Yeah. So I always have a book, an audiobook book I can access on my phone. There's something on Kindle. I'll have my book slipped into my purse. Like, I know where I'm going and what I want to read next. And so kind of have a plan. Because if I have to think about it, a lot of times then it's not going to happen. <laughs> Another thing you can do is don't be afraid of taking a day or two midterm. Yes. And say, okay, hang on, 
mom needs a couple of days. So we're just going to put lessons on hold for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do what I need to do. And then we'll just tack a couple of days on at the end of our term to make up for those if we need to. Sure. But it doesn't have to be just you know, calendar-related holidays. No, it's so true. I was raised by two educators, and so they. I remember very clearly days where I didn't have school, but they had to work for in-service days, they called them. And so taking in-service days as a homeschooler, that's really invaluable. <laughs> I, I like to do it um, when the weather's really nice, so we can actually go outside. I can sit there on the, on the blanket and read, and they'll play and play and play and play and play and play. Um, so the kids aren't complaining about that. And, you know, those are days where I can kind of just take that time and not feel like I'm pressured with time. Yes, mm -hmm. that's a huge thing. Yeah. One other, not trick, but one other strategy that might be helpful mm -hmm. is to set aside, you know, some moms might say this 15 minutes a day, I don't have that sure. in my day. And with some ages of kids, I believe it. it's yeah. hard. Yeah, <laughs> yes. very hard. So if you can't just grab it here and there, what can be very helpful is to say, all right, in our schedule, I am going to institute mm -hmm. a 20-minute read and rest time every day, when, whenever it fits, you know, maybe after lunch, maybe right before supper, where it fits best in your home. But that 20-minute rest and read time, everybody is on their beds or in a designated place with quiet toys. You don't have to sleep. Yes. Because, you know, you can't force your child to sleep. Sure. This we learn. Yes, yes. But everyone needs to play quietly until the timer dings. And you can use that 20 minutes to get in your 15-minute read and still have five minutes to actually regain your sanity. Oh, that's a great idea. And I think it's really good anyway, whether you're using it to read or not, to train the children to have a rest time every day, um, because you need that to be filled up and to keep your cup full, to be able to pour out for your family. Um, and I think that while you teach them that while they're younger, the older ones, it's just normal for them. And I think they even look forward to it. So that's a really good idea that it doesn't have to be some extra time that you don't have, yeah. but it can come from the time you're already giving to your family as well. And I think it's a gift to the children to give them the habit of solitude. Yes. So many children don't have that. They're just go, 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 go. Giving them time to sit and process all the things they're learning yeah. I think is, is a good thing. And then we can use that time to grab our little 15-minute read. Sure. But it is important. Pre-reading is. What would you say to the mom who feels guilty right now? Oh, I'm not pre-reading my kids' books. I'm a bad mommy. Just give me the bad mommy trophy. No. I'll put it on the shelf. What would you say to encourage her? Okay, so there's no room for shame. That only makes us dig a, a, di a deeper hole. I would just mm -hmm. say that if that is something that you feel that you want to implement, just start small. Pick one book, look at what your children are reading or will be reading, and maybe think of what might have the meatiest conversations or could possibly have something problematic or just something that you may enjoy as the mother. And just pick that one thing and just start. So it doesn't have to be um, all or nothing. Just something is better than nothing. And I think that once you get the ball rolling, that a lot of moms will find that they're enjoying it so much that it feels like less of a chore and more of a joy. Good words. Yeah. Thanks, Amber. You're welcome. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We'll see you next time.